Good morning, church. So good to see you here this morning. I uh, hope you enjoyed shine as you came in. I hope you've enjoyed a lot of blessings over the week and the weekend. And I hope as our worship service continues on, you have your Bibles and you are ready to worship God now in the Word, that that's a blessing to you as well. Let me just say welcome to the visitors. There's some uh, faces I haven't seen before, and there's some that uh, haven't seen in a little bit. And it's good to see you guys here, and uh, glad you could be here and worship with us. It's always a thrill. Some of you are online. I know some of our members are awaiting uh, surgeries and such. You are missed, but we are glad that you're watching. And some new people are watching online as well, and we're thankful that you could tune in and get to know us this way, though we do look forward to getting to see you in person as soon as possible. Starting a new series where we're talking about feasting, about eating. Last week was with God, and we have these uh, incredible stories that exist, narratives in the scriptures where people were eating in a way that was quite unusual, remarkable with God. This time we're focusing on family, feasting with family. You may have a favorite moment that you ate with your family. I don't know what happened at that moment. Did someone tell a joke? Was there an argument that broke out and you still laugh about it, hopefully 20 years later? Or do you hold on to those grudges and you can't wait till it comes back up again? I love feasts with family and, and, and people for sure. Uh, last night I got to go to Louisville and had uh, dinner with a friend of mine. I mean, he's as close as a brother. Hadn't seen him in a long, long time just to catch up and see what's going on. Man, we laughed and we uh, told jokes, reminisced, and it was kind of funny what I remembered that he didn't and that uh, he remembered that I didn't. We went and saw a basketball game one time up in Cleveland. Got to see LeBron play, which was kind of cool. Also got to see Shaq. And it was a fun time. And I was like, do you remember when you fist bumped Shaq? And he's like, I've never fist bumped Shaq. I was like, you completely fist bumped Shaq. Because I held my hand out for him to fist bump me and he skipped me to you. And I lost my dream and you don't even remember fist bumping an iconic figure like Shaq. And he's like, nope, nothing. So good times when you can have meals with people, when you can share those feasting moments. In the Bible, what we're going to look at today with family, these meals that take place. And God's given us these examples over and over and over again. In fact, if you want to go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 43, that's the first one we're going to look at. And if we're in Genesis 43, you may remember this is probably the time of Joseph. It will be. And this is the patriarchal time period. We're going to start there, and then we're going to move into the time period of the Law of Moses in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and then we're going to end up into the Christian age. And what we're going to see is these examples of feasting with family, and there's, there's elements of it that God clearly wants us to understand and know and have an expectation for, the kind of people that we need to be. But it didn't matter what time period, whether it was the patriarchal, the Law of Moses, or the Christian age, these are uh, expectations God has for us at these meal times, incredible things were unfolding. The focus isn't so much what's happening in the meal, that's just a, a catalyst to allow it to unfold, but the relationships that exist at these times and in these moments, the healing that needs to take place, or the, the blessing and the honoring that unfolds during these meals is what's so notable. These aren't just common meals. These are moments in which godliness is being presented to us in a most excellent way. And that's what we've got to pay attention to. When we think about our relationships with family in a way that honors God and glorifies Him, are we just trying to get by at the least amount necessary? Or do these relationships matter in such a way that we approach them with utter excellence? We give to them. There's three things I want us to focus on for each of these examples. That's the ambition someone had going into these meals. What did they intend to have happen? And was it a lofty, godly ambition in the midst of these feasts with family? Second, what actions did they take? Sacrificial actions to take to make these things happen. And what was the attitudes, the godly characteristics that they carried in that made the, all the difference in the world? Because if you don't have the right ambition, the actions, or the attitudes, your relationships will not be as God intended. And these are moments that unfolded during mealtime. Such a common thing. Such a common thing. Let's look at Genesis chapter 43. It's particularly interesting. You know that if it's in the time of Joseph that there's a lot that's going on. This is a point in which he is already second in command in Egypt. Second in command in Egypt. Only the Pharaoh is more powerful. 
The man wields incredible power, but God has put him into place so he could be a blessing for all the people. A famine is in the land. I mean, it's a bad famine. And in the situation here, they have prepared by stocking up for seven years with the abundance that existed in uh, Egypt. But his brothers had come down previously, and of course there was a bit where he accused them of being spies. He knew them. They didn't know him. And you think about all the ways that he was treated. They abused him, and they mocked him, and they, they mistreated him, and they wanted to kill him at one point. They literally were having a meal themselves and talking about his fate and his future, and they threw him into a pit. But eventually they sold him off to slavers. They sold him off to slavers. You would think from a worldly standpoint that his ambition for this meal would be vengeance, would be revenge. Well, maybe the bare minimum. Or maybe he would just ignore them. But as a man of God, he went for excellence in his ambition. They've come back to him at this point to retrieve uh, Benjamin. They had to bring back the youngest son. and they, were, he, they had left Simeon in prison with him, and now they're bringing him back with money and such. Let's begin in chapter 43, verse 16. When Joseph saw Benjamin, they've returned to Egypt with them. He said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home. Slaughter an animal, that's important, and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Okay. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now, they were afraid because they knew he had incredible power. They didn't know who he was. They thought already there's an accusation against them. Already they've got one of their brothers enslaved. Their father, Jacob, thinks that Benjamin might be murdered. They might all die in this situation. That's why he sent a gift and doubled the money with them. So they go into the house, and they said, it's because of his money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in, so that he may make a case against us and seize us and take us as slaves with our donkeys. They were fearful in this encounter, thinking their lives are doomed one way or the other. Now they're going to fail their father too because they brought Benjamin into this existence. So they go draw near to the steward and they explain the situation. They said, hey, we brought the money back. We don't know how it got to us. In fact, we brought more money just in case we can, we can buy more food. They're hoping to go home, but they're fearful that they may not. Joseph's steward says to them, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your fathers has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And then he brought Simeon out to them. He takes them into the house and he gives them water, enough to wash their feet. And he also gives them feed for their donkey. They're getting treated really, really well. There's this uncomfortable situation because this is not their expectations. And yet Joseph is preparing this feast with his family. He's got a high ambition for it. When Joseph came home in verse 26, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house. And they bowed down before him to the earth. Their father had sent uh, items from their land, uh, potassium nuts, almonds, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, that sort of thing with the money. And they were going to present it, trying to make a good relationship out of this. But Joseph's not interested in any of that. We know because instead of acknowledging those objects, the first thing he asks them is about their well-being in verse 27. And he says, is your father well? The old moon, man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? His focus is on the relationship. Not the objects, not the money, not even the past, really, but what it can be. That's a high ambition. They said, your servant, our father, is in good health. He's still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. And then he lifted up his eyes and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. And he said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And... He said, God, be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and he wept there. Then he washed his face and he came out and he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. He had to compose himself. There was a time for emotion and there was a time for composure. And this needed to unfold in the right way. So then they bring them, uh, his brothers in and the Egyptians, and they set them in three groupings. Joseph, being a man of high ranking and honor, would be set by himself. His brothers would be set by themselves, separate from his table. And then the Egyptians would be set separate because it was viewed as an abomination for the Egyptians to eat with the Hebrews. Now, his brothers were astonished because of the way that he arranged them. It was from the oldest by his birthright down to the youngest. 
confuses them because how would he know this? I mean, you could probably figure out the oldest to the youngest. They probably look pretty different, right? From Reuben all the way down to Benjamin. But the middle ones, that could be kind of confusing. But somehow he knew how to order them and set them by rank. It was a familiar thing, a family thing. And then he did quite the remarkable thing, the actions that he's taken place. He's already slaughtered an animal. Unusual. The typical diet that would unfold at that time, certainly for Hebrews, would have been bread and maybe some vegetables, something pretty simple during the noontime meal, maybe a bigger thing at night, maybe. But this is during a famine in which people are really, really suffering, so much so that they had to travel pretty far to Egypt just to get food. But because this is a meal to feast with family, and because he has high ambitions for what his relationship with his brothers could be, and how they could be blessed, and how they could be forgiven, he's putting a lot of sacrifice and a lot of action into this, that they, they had meat. This wouldn't have been a common meal for them to have. And on top of having meat for his brothers, and they are set in an arrangement that recognizes who they are and knowing who they are, he rises up from his table. He takes from his table and goes to present them their food. The Bible says this, so he set them in a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptian who ate with them by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for it is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright, the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they would drink and they were merry with him. I find this an especially amazing story. From a worldly standpoint, we could expect vengeance. We could expect him to put them into slavery. They had mistreated him to the nth degree, abused him, beaten him, thrown him down into a pit, wanted to kill him, sold him to slaves. It would be easy for him to feel bitter. It would be easy for him to turn away and say, you caused me to be a slave. You caused me to be thrown into prison. You caused everything in my life. He could have played the victim. But instead of playing the victim, he had an ambition for his family and said, we got to get past those moments. This meal will be a time we come together and there can be forgiveness. This meal will be a time in which we can have blessing. This meal will be a time where he's going to take it on himself to do the godly thing and be a blessing to his family. Families are tricky that way. There are no perfect families. I mean, you may present that on social media and you may see families that appear that way on the television. Falsehood. You all know it's a falsehood. I think that's why the reality TV shows are, are so popular. At least there's some manner of a little bit of honesty in the complete craziness of those people. So even though we know there's craziness in our lives, we're just like, I'm not them. That's really crazy people. You may have tensions in your family. Maybe there's sometimes you don't want to invite someone from your family over to your house anymore. You're done with them. This is an example of Godliness, godliness, ambition to see what's best for your family, even when they don't deserve it, even when you aren't going to get anything out of it. What more could they give to this man, the second most powerful person in the world? Nothing. They were hungry. They were starved. They were belittled. They had no power. And he had just cause from a worldly standpoint to be cruel to them, but he chose godliness. He had the ambition for his family. He took the action to sacrifice, give them so much more that they deserved. And then he had the godly attitude to serve them, to humble himself and serve them by bringing food to their table and giving Benjamin five times as much as anybody else. Incredible. In chapter 45, when he reveals who he is, and as of course great weeping and such, he tells them, he tells them, you didn't do this. God brought me to this position so I can bless you, so you can move down here and be with me. I love this story. I love it because it's exceptional. But it could be the norm. What if we looked at these stories, this one and the ones we're going to look at, not as the exceptional thing, but the norm? What if this is how we expected ourselves to be? Because it is how God expects us to be. 
Do we accept that, take ownership of that, and decide that this is how we're going to feast with family? Forgiving the past, not letting things hold us back, but be united. And in fact, if it takes sacrifice on my part, let me commit to it. If it takes an extra measure of godly uh, mindset and emotion and, and belief and hope and forgiveness, let me have that. In fact, maybe we need to pray to have those things rather than being restricted. You may say, hey, you don't know my family. Truth is, a lot of people are probably thinking that right now, which means we all kind of do have those experiences. We just don't talk about them as much. Which means we all need to be focused on forgiveness and unity and moving past. It's tough, I get it, but we're all going through that. This is an example of what's exceptional. Not the bare minimum. God didn't create us to live the bare minimum. That's lazy. If we're going to be people of faith and be godly people, we have to do the godly things. And that's having the ambition, having the action, and having the attitudes that represent that. That's with direct family. Go with me over to 2 Samuel chapter 9. I find this one exceptional too. This is an example of where it's not direct family, but because of a relationship that existed prior between David, King David, he's king now, but he was going to be king, and his best friend, Jonathan, they made a commitment, a covenant, long ago. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 20, verses 14, 15, that passage right there. Even though Jonathan knew he wouldn't be king, but David would, he said to take care of him, watch over him, and not just him, but also his house after he died. David is being mindful of that. This isn't blood family, it's chosen family. Not blood family, it's chosen family. And that's still significant. David chose that friendship with Jonathan, and it meant something immensely to him. So much so that deep into his kingship, he's wondering how he can keep that covenant. Jonathan's been dead some time. Saul's been dead some time. David's serving as king. You would think, and many people might forgive him, of like, man, you got so much on your platter. You're the king. Why would you be focusing on these old relationships? Because he loves Jonathan. And he made a commitment, and he's choosing his family. So, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. When they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Now you may think, what an odd thing to bring up at this point. Why was that necessary? Well, typically when one king would take over from another, it would not be uncommon that you would lay waste to all the family members of the previous king, lest they rise up and attack you. This would be a worldly way of things un unfolding. It was pretty normal. Those of you that watch a series of uh, fantasy TV shows and whatnot, uh, your Game of Thrones and such, you, you may recognize that behavior. May you be forgiven. <laughs> Ziba told the king he's crippled. He's not a threat. Physically in combat, he's not a threat to you. You're David. He's a great warrior king anyway, right? And in service to the, to, to the law, he's really not going to be a, a person that's going to attempt to take your power anyway. He, he's lame. He's, he's crippled. He couldn't serve in the temple in a multitude of ways. So maybe Ziba, who used to serve under Saul, is trying to protect Jonathan's son a little bit. He's far away in this town called Lodabar, which means uh, no word, no pasture, no thing. It's basically a vile village farther to the north. He's kind of being protected, hidden out a little bit. Again, because the norm would have been to kill the family members of the previous king. But David said, is he there? Ziba is saying, yeah, he's there. Send for him. So he goes and he gets Mephibosheth and he brings him before him. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the chosen family of David, prostrates himself before him. He bows down before him. And he says, Mephibosheth, and he says, here is your servant. Verse 7, David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Mephibosheth falls down and, and says, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? 
He knew he was in no position to ask any such thing, and he knew he was in no position whatsoever to expect such a thing, but yet here the king, the king is honoring him, not just with his life, but with land. And not just with land, but a continual seat at his table to eat. Family. Eating with family. Mephibosheth did nothing to deserve this. He was born into that family. But David cared so much about honoring that covenant. But more than just honoring the covenant, it's the relationship that mattered. You have to uphold the relationship. And those take work, and those take efforts, and those take a lot of consideration. And even though he was king and could have had the excuses to ignore it, I got too much going on, even for this one individual, he put forth his ambition, his action, and his attitude and allowed Mephibosheth to sit at his table continually. Not a small thing. You're sitting at the royal table. You're being provided for, and someone deeply cares about you to put that much effort into it. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. I think it's incredibly remarkable because it reminds us where we're going next, John 21, if you want to turn there. How much effort God puts in our relationship with him. We don't deserve it, same as Mephibosheth. We can't really earn it, same as Mephibosheth. But there's a degree of love that God has showered upon us that we may say, I don't deserve it, rightly so. I can't earn it, rightly so. And yet God continues to have this ambition for our relationship, that he would extend himself, keep making efforts towards us, giving us these opportunities to accept incredible blessings, to feast with family. And make no mistake, it is family. In John chapter 21, Jesus cares so much about his relationship with his apostles, his disciples, that he's put in this effort. He's initiated this exchange. In John chapter 21, this is after the resurrection. This is even after he's appeared to them. They're out fishing, and they recognize that it's him on the shore. Peter dives into the water to swim to him. But in John chapter 21, you get this moment where Jesus invites them to come up and to have breakfast with him. It's so much simpler than what the others had done. I mean, we had uh, eating right in front of the second most powerful person in Egypt. I'm sure there was a grandiosity to that situation. And to even have him come serve you would have been something. And even for Mephibosheth, it would have been sort of a grandiosity to eat at the royal table of the king of Israel, the mighty warrior David. That must have been something. We're now on a Sure, outside. But I'm telling you, it's so much more grand than any castle, any fortress, any banquet hall ever. This is Peter and the disciples sitting down in this intimate moment with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the risen Jesus. And it's Jesus who's initiated this. It's it's Jesus' ambition that they should have a relationship at all. It's Jesus' actions that have even got them to this point. And it's that godly attitude he's had that is now going to help Peter confront his weaknesses and to help him have a place in the kingdom. And not just a place, but a work and an effort and a purpose. that should all be resonating with each of us. Because that same ambition and that action and that attitude extends to us. Like I said last week, this is very personal. It's simple, but it's very personal. It's just some fish on the shore. Very simple, little fire going on there. No great banqueting table, no fancy clothes, none of it. But I would take this moment over all the others. You're eating with Jesus. His family. All right, so here's what he says to them. They'd eaten breakfast. Verse 9, as soon as they'd come to the land, they saw the fire of coals. That's it, fire of coals. And fish laid on it and bread. Simple meal. Probably tastes a little bit extra since Jesus is cooking it. Jesus said to them, verse 12, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. And then Jesus came and took the bread, and he gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he begins that exchange. Three times he'll ask him. Of course, Peter denied him three times. 
who is accepting him back. But Jesus is taking the initiative. Jesus is providing the food, literally, spiritually. And it's this godly attitude of forgiveness. Did he have the right to condemn Peter and cast him aside? Yeah, of course. Of course he did. It was a foul thing that Peter did. But did he have the right heart and the right sense of justice and the right sense of care and love and foresight to see what Peter could be? Yes. And he's acting on that. And of course, Peter is going to become Peter. The one who would speak on the day of uh, Pentecost. It would be Peter who would carry the message out. It would be Peter who would see even go to the most unexpected people to be able to teach and to convert them. And it's, this moment was a real turning point where he's feasting with family. Family. You know, God said, the Holy Spirit revealed to us through Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, that it really is family, us and Jesus, us and God. He said that he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. Adoption as sons. That's how he sees us, as family. Does that mean something to us? Because it clearly means something to him. And if it means something to us, because it means something to him, then the way that we eat with one another, feast with one another, and have the same ambitions towards one another, that we have a close relationship and that's a big deal. And that we have the willingness to take actions, even sacrificial ones, and even extend ourselves pretty far to make it happen. And do we have the right attitude towards one another as family? That's a pretty big deal. What we have in these three stories, these three narrative accounts, whether in the patriarchal age or the law of Moses or the Christian age, is something we have even right now where we can still have those ambitions, those actions, and those attitudes to honor God, to please Him, and to work on these relationships that we grow close together. Even if great harm has been done in the past, like Joseph, we've got to forgive that and find a way to come together. It may take time, because it certainly took time for him, but we got to make that an ambition. It may be that there's people that are not blood family, but you got to have an ambition and have an action and have an attitude to grow your family and let people have a seat at your table because you love them so much, you're willing to go that far. It may be that you have this moment where people don't know Jesus, but if you have an ambition for them too and you're willing to take the action and you have that attitude, you're inviting them to come to know Jesus in the same way that Peter did. It's a thing that we have to take ownership of. God didn't create us for just getting by. These are difficult challenges for sure, but that's what we've got to be interested in, the hard parts of Christianity. It's where the meat is, those hard, challenging parts of Christianity where we're really putting the, the, the meaningfulness behind family. You can just say you're a brother. You can just say you're a sister. But it's meaningless unless the action's there, and it's meaningless, unless the attitude's there. Those things make all the difference in the world. What will you commit to that? I love this moment here, because this is the second time I've seen Greg capture that child. Those of you that can't see, we've got a loose one, which I love. It's not a distraction at all. I love it. I'd rather have the kids be active in church. But Greg does an excellent job of wrangling those children. So... Thank you for that. I really do love that. I'm not making fun of anybody. That's family. <laughs> That's family. <laughs> Could have been a more appropriate time. Listen, we're going to find ourselves on two sides of this. Either we're going to be the people that need to be the recipients of that. We may be Joseph's brothers at some times. Humble ourselves and build that relationship. We may be Mephibosheth at times. Maybe we've crippled our lives because of sin. Maybe we've crippled our lives because of absolutely terrible choices. We don't play the victim, but we honor and dedicate ourselves to those that would lift us up. Perhaps we're Peter at times, and we need to listen to the Lord and draw closer to Him and hope for His forgiveness and seek that out in spite of our failures. As Christians, we might be on the other side of it where we might need to be Joseph at times. We might need to be King David at times. We might need to show the same love and care that Jesus did at times. Both those things are necessary. 
That's the many facets of life. It's the nuances of life. But those relationships are what matters. I'm grateful for these stories and scriptures, these feasts with family. Family is incredibly, incredibly important. Don't take any of those meals lightly. It's easy to just get together with people and kind of acknowledge how is your debt good, how is your debt great, whatever. Pass the mashed potatoes. Okay. Engage with one another. Cherish one another. Give yourselves in those moments. Open yourself up to them. Make the relationships mean something. I'd even challenge you this week to go a little bit extra. Maybe there's people here in your church family you've never had a meal with. Invite them. Have an ambition to grow those relationships. I bet there's people you don't yet know. You may say, David, this is my first time here. I don't know anybody. In which case I would say, you've got 300 people to choose from. You're in the best position at all. It may be hard, but let's do the hard things. Care about those relationships. Maybe it's not today you do that because you've already got plans. I get it. But set, set that as a goal this week. Draw closer to one another. Have an ambition to grow. Put in the actions and have a godly attitude. Our church family is so important. We don't want it to coast. It's got to mean something. Have the substance. Today, we want to help you in whatever way possible. We'll conclude there. We'll move into the invitation to be part of God's family. We'd love for you to take part in those feasts and to be a part of God's family. Now, that's not something we bestow upon you. That's what God does. But we are charged to share His Word, which tells us how to do that. The more you know and understand God's Word, then you can understand who He expects you to be and what kind of life He wants to promise to give you, that He has promised to give you, and how that's found in Jesus. When you understand that Jesus is the Christ, He's the Messiah, He's the Savior, He died for your sins, He wants you to have the best possible life in Him. When you got that and you understand that, you'll you'll grow in that, you'll develop that, and you believe what He says, you trust what He says, you're willing to obey Him, man. You're at a a, a wonderful, beautiful part in your life where you've got to then focus on the commitment to Him. I will live for Jesus as part of the family the family of God. To be a son, to be a brother, to be a sister is so incredible in the family of God. You must acknowledge Him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Commit yourself to Him. And when you choose to be baptized, it's not a ritual, it's not just some only a symbolic act. That is the moment your sins are washed away and that you put on Christ. That's the moment you become a Christian. That's the moment you become part of the family of God. That's something we can help you with here today. Maybe you've put it off. Maybe you've been thinking about it. Maybe you're wondering if this is the time now. Yes, let this be the time right now. Don't hesitate. If there's a way we can support you and love you and care for you as family, let us know. We would love to do that, especially as we stand and as we sing.